All right, in this video, I'm going to show you how I take a Commodore 64 that was previously broken and bring it back to life, as you see here. So uh, stay tuned, and uh, I'll show you how the process goes. All right, here we can see the machine all hooked up. So let's try it out. Flipping the power switch. Well, we're getting a NTSC signal, but it's just a black screen. And if you notice here, we're getting no power light either. So basically what this little bit of information tells me is number one, somebody's been inside this unit before and either hooked up the power light incorrectly or it's just unconnected. Number two, a black screen could be a myriad of different problems, but uh, we'll crack this thing open and see what we find. Okay, here is the same machine uh, pulled apart. I'll give you, give you a quick scan of the board here. Uh, as you can see, this is a 1982 model. And how you can determine that is number one. If you can see that, that's a five pin uh, input jack where the audio and video comes out. This revision of boards only uh, supports composite video output and mono audio as well. Uh, some more things that we can tell pretty easily just by scanning over the board here. Uh, the majority of the day codes on the chips are uh, early 1983. Uh, we see there CIA1, U1. Uh, is a 6526A with a date code of 87. That's clearly been replaced at some point. Uh, here, that's the original 82S100 PLA. Uh, 8238 is the date code on that. Uh, this was very likely a repurposed uh, board from the original silver label recall. But uh, there's the SID chip there. As you can see, that's a 6581R4AR which uh, is a quite a desirable model of SID chip with a date code as well of 1987. Now you see these uh, yellow, I think they're polyester capacitors. Uh, that's uh, one of the, the multiple factory errors made on these 326-298-1982 boards. These are the filter capacitors for the SID chip and they are incorrect values. Uh, to get the correct filter sound out of a 1982 board, these should be replaced with 470 picofarad ceramic capacitors. So uh, anyways, we're going to hook this back up here and uh, test it one more time and see if we can get some life out of it on the dead test cartridge. Alright, machine's been hooked back up again with my dead test cartridge. Now we'll uh, turn the power on once more and see what it gives us. Okay, now this could be a good one. Let's wait a second and see if the dead test cartridge actually boots up. It takes approximately 20 seconds for the dead test cartridge to boot up. Looks like we're not getting anything. And we're also not getting any flashing codes uh, at the beginning either, which would indicate a bad RAM IC. Uh, this block of eight chips here are the 4164 DRAMs. They're 64 kilobyte by one bit. Uh, 1982 boards tend to be fairly robust. Uh, they do have memory troubles, but for the most part, uh, they they have tended to survive better than some of the other revisions of boards. Now, had we booted up the dead test cartridge and gotten, gotten a flashing screen code. Uh, this chart here will help you decode what those flashing codes mean. So for instance, if it would have flashed once uh, for C64 revision A and B boards, it would have been indicating U12 was stuck. Uh, B3 boards only have two RAM ICs, so there's U9, U10, 
this is a Rev E is a C64 short board uh, and so on and so forth. So this is a really handy little chart here that I have in my super handy dandy Commodore schematics folder. Uh, as you can see I've got there's the 326298, uh, 250407, 250425, so on and so forth. So this is my little uh, handy guide of information here when I'm taking a look at a 64. So uh, anyways, it's clear that the dead test cartridge is doing nothing, so let's investigate this first. Okay, what we've done here is we've attached uh, little grabber micro hooks to my multimeter here. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to check to see, uh, we're basically checking for voltages on the board. We're looking for 5 volts on the main logic ICs. So I've got one grounded to the RF modulator there. We have this one attached to the VCC of the 74LS257 memory multiplexers. So uh, let's flip the power switch here and see what our reading is. Hmm. As you can see, we're not even getting a half volt DC. Uh, in a working machine, this should be 5 volts for sure. So uh, it's pretty clear that. Uh, we've got a pretty good idea on what the problem is at this point. Uh, we are missing 5 volt DC on the main logic chips. Now uh, this could be due to a number of things. This could be a failed power switch, a shorter IC, uh, could be a lot of different stuff. So uh, let's continue digging into this one and see if we can't bring it back to life. Okay, so basically what I've done so far is uh, I've removed the board from the case here. Uh, I've also desoldered the uh, the back shielding here to expose the back of the PCB. Uh, to my knowledge, all NTSC uh, Commodore 64 boards sold in North America, Canada, etc. They uh, have these shields soldered to the backs of the boards. Uh, here's an example of one right here. Uh, I believe this is due to the stringent FCC regulations of the day. Um, as you can see here, these shields are got little tabs that fold over here and get soldered to the ground plane. You need a pretty stout soldering iron to undo those. So uh, I, I, what I use is my actual desoldering iron. I just use the iron portion to heat them up and bend them up and get the shield off. So. Uh, Anyways, I'll explain what I've uh, basically uncovered so far. Um, normally when I have an issue like this, I'll start at the uh, power socket and start working my way up, you know, checking for continuity, so on and so forth. There is the main 5 volt coming in. Uh, we've got 5 volts on the board all the way up to this point. Now you would think, okay, maybe the switch is bad, because that is a very common occurrence in Commodore 64. So it does certainly happen. Um, I used my little uh, test clips there and ohmed out the switch. The switch is fine. Uh, we basically lose 5 volts right here at this area though. Everything from here on back, there's continuity from the chips up to here, but something's missing here. So let me show this to you. Okay, there's the actual switch itself. Now, as you can see, a lot of these 1982 boards, they uh, the earliest ones have green switches. Uh, these somewhat later ones have uh, red switches. Now, if you see the legs on that switch, they're heavily tarnished. They're basically black. I'm assuming this is because the switches were, the legs of them were probably silver plated, and the silver has completely tarnished the black. Uh, it's not normally a problem because... Uh, the leg underneath that and the solder is actually uh, protected essentially uh, in, in the pool of solder. So uh, let me get this set up and I'll, I'll show you what I've discovered. Okay, I've got my uh, meter hooked up to the 5 volt input on one of the chips. Now you have to bear with me, this is pretty difficult to do holding the tablet one hand. So anyways, what we're looking at here, that's the main 5 volt rail, the way this board is designed. Uh, all of the 5 volts for the logic chips come off of these branches here. Now if we follow this down, down, all the way around, 
this line here is essentially like a, the main 5 volt rail or bus or whatever you want to call it. So we still got continuity here, still got it here. Keep going all the way up. And then here's the output of the switch in question. Now, uh, we don't have nothing here, don't have nothing here. But if we take the tip of the probe here, we got continuity there. So what it looks like we're dealing with here is just a simple cold solder joint right here on the switch. So what I'm going to do at this point is completely desolder and remove the switch and re-solder it and see how we get on then. Alright, as you can see I have the switch completely desoldered. I have the uh, holes, the through holes completely uh, cleared out and everything nice and clean. Ready to be re reinstalled with some fresh solder. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out that could have uh, contributed to this issue is uh, if you see the design of the board here, you see how uh, incredibly like small the pads are. Uh, there's through hole plating, but the shoulders for the solder to sit on is pretty small. So if there was a cold solder joint from the factory, uh, it could have gone unnoticed for years. The machine could have worked and then, you know, uh, age, tarnishing, uh, oxidization could have uh, crept in and caused this to fail. So uh, at any rate, let's go ahead and uh, reinstall the switch and uh, see uh, what happens. Here's some close-ups of the switch. As you can see, it's a 2 amp at 250 AC or 5 amps at 150 AC. C and K, USA. There's an interesting story about this switch. Uh, in the book, uh, what is it, Company on the Edge, Brian Bagnall, about Commodore's history, uh, there's a little uh, section in it talking about when they were coming out with the Commodore 64s, they were shopping around for switches, and they found a company that produced the, uh, I'm not sure if it's this one in particular, uh, it was probably the green switches, but uh, back on topic here. Uh, they got some samples of the switches from the company and they were perfect for the Commodore 64 application and uh, Commodore placed an order from the switches and the company basically freaked out because they were used to making you know fairly small quantities of these switches for consumer applications and Commodore wanted to order a you know a million of them or something uh, so it's kind of an interesting story uh, some of the history of these things all right, anyways, I'm going to the switch in there and see what happens. All right, I have the switch reinstalled now. Uh, sorry about the flux residue. Uh, I will clean that up here when I'm finished. But uh, I have my uh, multimeter set back up here in continuity mode. Uh, let's go ahead and... Yep, we're still good here. Going all the way up. See, before we didn't have anything on the switch. Let's flip the switch on. And we've got continuity here as well. So uh, let's plug it back in and see. Alrighty, because we just tested it there with the uh, power switch fixed. Let's verify that we are getting our 5 volts for sure. And uh, got the same arrangement as before here. And uh, we flip the switch. That's much better. We are now getting our 5 volts. And look what just happened. It actually booted. How about that? Alright now, let's uh, do some more thorough diagnostics. Now that we have the system up, we can start testing. Right, what I've done now here is uh, set up the Commodore 64 test harness. I'm not sure you can see it too well there. There you go. Uh, what this device is here, this is the keyboard loop back, this is the user port loop back, this is the cassette port loop back, this is the serial port loop back, and these wires all the way around here test the joystick ports. And we also have a cartridge there with the harness program on it. So let's uh, fire this up and see what we get. Now the thing with the uh, test harness here, 
uh, there are some misconceptions about it. The test harness's utility is not all that fantastic for a machine that's otherwise dead. Unfortunately, the machine has to essentially mostly work for this to even function. Now what this is useful for, however, is uh, testing the entirety of the machine at once once it's already basically working. Uh, the other thing is too is that you can't believe the results that this thing gives you. So uh, it can lead you down the wrong path sometimes. Like for instance if it tells you it has a bad CIA chip or whatever, uh, that may not necessarily be the case. So take what this program gives you with a grain of salt for sure. Uh, as we can just see here, uh, the machine completely passed the test. Uh, I didn't get any errors on anything. So chances are, we have another good Commodore. Now something I've talked about before on this channel is uh, these early 1982 boards have a couple factory defects. Uh, the main one being the SID chip capacitors. The uh, R10 here, resistor R10 actually lowers the composite video output to a point that causes the, the video output to be pretty dim. Another thing to note here too is partially due to the design of the video chip, which is a ceramic chip here, uh, and the design of the layout of the board, you see these, uh, these little ghosting lines here from all of the objects. Uh, you can get rid of that by uh, replacing the, uh, the VIC chip uh, and also exchanging resistor R10 to a 120 ohm resistor that it's supposed to be. The factory installed a 300 ohm resistor. And as another video of my, uh, my small little YouTube channel here, I've kind of experimented with a little modification here uh, for the reset line to allow chips such as the Easy Flash cartridge here to operate on these early boards. A lot of people kind of uh, shun these boards because they only have composite video output. But with a couple fairly easy modifications, uh, they can be turned into a perfectly serviceable C64. Uh, and that's part of my goal with these videos is to uh, basically uh, clear their name, so to speak. I'd, I'd like to see more people use these machines because there's still a lot of them around. And, uh, you know, like I said, a couple easy modifications, a resistor here or there, change a couple capacitors. Uh, you could have a really solid, good running machine. Uh, so anyways, let's uh, start putting this thing back together again, and uh, we'll finish up the video. Alright, you've got the uh, board finished and reinstalled back in the case. Uh, I went ahead and replaced resistor R10, as you can see right here. That would be uh, that one right there. It's hard to point to it. But uh, that should improve the uh, video quality output quite a bit. Uh, another thing that I always do uh, is I refresh the heatsink compound that uh, goes on this little tongue here. Because when this cover goes back onto the can here for the, the VIC chip, that's what creates the thermal contact between the chip and this uh, the lid of the, the can there that the VIC chip lives in. Uh, for now, I'm just going to leave the uh, filter capacitors alone and not worry about the reset mod. Uh, main reason being, I don't have any more SID filter capacitors. <laughs> so, uh, I'll worry about that later when I get some more in. Uh, but for now, I'm going to go ahead and uh, add some fresh heat sink compound to uh, the top of this and get, get it buttoned back up and uh, we'll see what we got. Alright, so I've got the uh, top back onto the Commodore 64 here. Uh, when I first started this video, I uh, noticed that when I switched it on, I wasn't getting a power LED, and I had remarked that it was probably uh, installed incorrectly or unconnected, and little did I know it was actually the cold solder joint that caused that problem. But as you can see, the video output is improved quite a bit by replacing resistor R10 with the 120 ohm resistor which it's supposed to have. Uh, for whatever reason, Commodore installed 300 ohm resistors. 
So uh, once you replace that resistor with the 120 ohm, it uh, brightens the video up quite a bit. Another thing that I like to do here uh, before I reinstall the case screws is to uh, check the keyboard functionality. And I just go through the keyboard and try each one of them one by one. And uh, this keyboard seems to be working just fine, but uh, if there were some keys that were intermittent or uh, you had to hit them really hard to get the key to register, you have to basically remove the keyboard, completely take it apart, clean it. It's not a particularly difficult job, it just takes a long time. Uh, this one seems to be okay, so I'm going to go ahead and put the screws in it and fire up a game. And then I will wrap up the video. Alrighty, we've got a Blue Max loaded up on the machine now. And uh, just a few purting thoughts here. Uh, using my uh, C64 SD Princess being my Mana Soft. Uh, it's basically an SD to IEC, but it has the ability to uh, to load uh, tap files as if you were loading them off of a cassette tape. And since I own a rather large collection of European PAL Commodore 64s, uh, a lot of the PAL games came on cassette tape and they're in tap format, so that's what I use to load them with. But as you can see, the machine's running Blue Max and doing a great job. Uh, so anyways, this was uh, basically uh, how I go about repairing Commodore 64s from start to finish. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. This one was a pretty different one as we didn't mess with any RAM chips or ROM chips or anything like that sort of thing. But uh, honestly, I wish they were all this easy to fix. <laughs> so anyways, hope you enjoyed the video and uh, I'll be back with another one at some point. Take care.